Hey, thank you so much for joining us. I am Jordana Brewster, and I'm having a conversation with Clay Crawford, thanks to In Creative Company. And I'm so excited to talk to him today because Clay and I worked together um, a couple of years ago on Lethal Weapon. And this actually feels like a similar format in that I'm asking you questions and I'm going to get you to open up and reveal so many parts of yourself that, that you didn't think you would, Clay. Um, Really kidding, funny. Aside, kidding aside, um, but I just rewatched uh, Killing of Two Lovers and again was sort of blown away by, by how masterful it is. And I've seen all of the reviews coming in and I kind of want to get your initial reaction um, to its reception because it just came out last week and now it's streaming and I just kind of want I'd love to hear um how you're responding to that initially and how gratifying that must be um yeah I mean look you know when we made the film the whole point was to go make something for very little so that we could kind of do it our way and to see a I think initially to see how it turned out um and when we watched the film initially I <clears throat> I know that I was I was surprised. I thought it played really well. Um, but we had gotten mixed reviews when showing to other people and we were looking to kind of raise money towards the end for post. And we weren't always getting um, a great response to the film. Um, but we kind of stuck to our guns and what we thought played well. So, yeah, I think a just getting into Sundance alone was extremely rewarding. And and um, I guess kind of in some way solidified, you know, Robert and I wanting to kind of work together and, and kind of follow the stream. So yeah, it, it's exciting. Um, you know, was there anything, was, was there anything specific that, that people were resistant to? Cause you said initially um, you were surprised that it was playing so well and, and that the response was sort of mixed. Was there anything that you and Robert had to absolutely stick to your guns to no pun intended. Um, <laughs> That's that, exactly uh, what it was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, Jordana, you know, it's like we, everyone said it was too slow. And um, you can't, we don't want to, first of all, you can't point a gun at a woman's head to open the film. Um, was the note that we had literally from every human being we showed the film to. Um, and then, the, you know, it's like we don't want to watch this guy run home for three minutes. Um, and for us, it was a. It was important to kind of convey to the audience exactly where this man was at, at this point in the relationship, and it didn't really matter as to why they had split up. It was just that he was at the end. Uh, he was truly kind of clinging to the edge of reality, um, and clearly didn't have the tools to kind of deal with the emotions uh, he was feeling. And also, we wanted to show the geography of what this man was dealing with on a daily basis. That when he woke up and he stepped outside. He could see the light that he no longer had. And it, it is, you know, for some people, I'm sure a painful three minutes to watch me just jog to the house. But we just thought it was crucial. Those opening few minutes were just so crucial for the entire film. Um, but consistently, we were just told it wouldn't work. And the number one note was, could you guys just try to maybe maybe you shouldn't tell the story in a linear fashion. Maybe you should kind of cut it up and and. Uh, and kind of play the cut in, in, in a different way and kind of, you know, rethink the narrative. And um, so we, we just felt for, you know, we spent 30 grand on this thing. We thought, why not just roll the dice? You know, let's just, let's just keep it our way. And then if everybody hates it, then I can always figure out to do something with my life. You know, <laughs> and Already a teacher. So we're like, why not? I'm really, really happy you guys stuck to your guns because having gone through a separation this year myself, and I was also watching it with my boyfriend who's also gone through separation. So I feel like the opening scene, the way you guys set the tone, the way you guys, what, what kept coming to mind was show, don't tell, show, don't tell. And I feel like right now with a lot of the movies and the way they're edited and the way we're sort of spoon fed information and we're not allowed to make decisions ourselves as an audience member about what we focus on. Um, I think that's what makes the movie work so beautifully. So I'm so happy that you guys, that we don't meet your kids till what we're 10 minutes in and then you see your character shift and we see how protective you are of them. And, and I feel like unless, 
as an audience member, we're on that journey with you and slowly riding in your car. And you just feel that sense of like, it's, it's so relatable because it's in real time. So I'm so glad you didn't take a note from anyone. I'm so, because I, I feel like it sets the tone for the movie and allows us to sort of endure that pain with you. Well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, you and I, when we were working together, we discussed this. It's, we are dealing with a visual medium. And I think as, as audiences now, we've been so inundated with material uh, and, and different formats of storytelling, and especially now with streaming, there's just, it's just constant content. And one of the positives is I think we're extremely sophisticated as audiences now. And I think just by now, you no longer need to cut away to the rifle hitting the ground. We can hear it and all of us instinctively know what that sound of metal is when it hits the ground. And for us, that's what we're, we've all, Robert and I have always been interested in is, is showing and not telling. And we're, we're working with our sound designer now, kind of brainstorming an idea of no dialogue in a film. Um, and just allowing to follow someone's journey and just live with them. Uh, and, and to me, that's extremely interesting. And I think audiences are ready for that. I think we love to observe others without having to be inundated with uh, exposition. Um, and speaking of that, that opening sequence where you're not saying much and a lot of it is just on your face and the camera seems to be very close to you, how did you, selfishly as an actor, I just want to pick your brain about this too. How did you resist the urge to, and, and also how did Robert direct you? Because because it is, it is such a complete mind fuck as you're driving in that car and you are just uh, oscillating between, am I gonna kill this dude? Am I gonna kill my wife? Am I gonna fucking kill myself? Like where, how did I get here, right? How did you, and yet your face is so, it's almost like you're showing so much with your eyes and yet there's no dialogue. There's no, there, you're not like pounding on the steering wheel. There's nothing, um, there's nothing that's, that's super showy. Like how did you prep for that? How many takes did that take? Like, how did you do that Clay Crawford? Well, I mean, look, I, I appreciate the compliment, you know, but I mean, A, we only had a couple of takes for every scene, sometimes only one take um, depending on the situation. But for that stuff, you know, I mean, we are actors. For uh, I enjoy. For me, I feel like I, I'm. I have. I have trouble performing well or executing the character properly if I have a lot to say, um, because I don't feel like we as humans truly communicate everything that we're feeling all the time. If anything, we cover it with other things. So to have an opportunity just to sit and think about those things, um, to let it wash through me and just let moments kind of pass and know that if I'm feeling it and thinking it, the camera's gonna read it, you know, cause the camera's quite sophisticated. It, it sees inside, you know, it sees things when we don't want it to. That's why I love documentaries. And I, I think that's what we all do. We're all drawn to those, those murder docudramas on Netflix, right? um, docu-series is that, of the, when the camera catches these, the, these little moments. So I had a lot of confidence in Robert um, in the way he was shooting it and knowing that we were going to have these long takes and also having an understanding of the structure of the story that you as an audience have a clear understanding. Again, introducing that weapon, you know where I'm at. And now I'm climbing out of the house and I'm going back now, following this guy. So by the time you're with me in those moments, there's no confusion about where my headspace is. So for me, it was having confidence in the material um, and the storytelling that the audience was with me at that point. And that, again, all I had to do is just be with the emotion and it would read. And do you think it's better for actors? Because I also noticed that Robert doesn't do, and even when, when we work together on the integrity of Joseph Chambers, I'm so used to, and I'm sure you are too with um, working with different directors It being one shot on me, one shot on the other actor. Um, whereas Robert does a take where it's, it might just be, he might just cover both actors in the same shot, like with you and your daughter in the, in the, in the car talking. And it, it, I think it's such a, it's a more beautiful and a more 
it's more fun as an audience member because you get to see both people at the same time and both people reacting to each other and you're not as manipulated. But did that give you freedom as, as an actor as well to just have the camera there and to just be able to play with one long scene? And I mean, it was sort of the same with your daughter and your, and most of the, the scenes were shot that way. Do you prefer that versus it being manipulated? Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I, mean, I think, A, selfishly, I prefer it just because you get that running start and you get to live in whatever that moment is. So um, I, I feel like when you, when you kind of, the way you discuss like shooting it traditionally, like when you and I were doing it on the show, I mean, you have to pace your performance and you also have to think about so many things technical. And for me as an actor, I'm naturally, I like to do things. I want my character to always have work, right? Because I feel like action motivates dialogue. And when we're shooting the way we were shooting the series, like, man, we were constantly thinking of every single, and I'm having to catalog it as I go. So I'm not just thinking about the performance. I'm also thinking about the edit and how the director is going to be able to put the performance together. Um, And yeah, I have to, I have to pace my performance, which is somewhat manipulating it. Right. If I know I've got to drop a tear at the, I know they're going to go to the close up if they're shooting it from 50 different angles. So I have to, pace that tear out and the emotion until it gets into the tight shot. And when you shoot the way that we shot this film, because again, limitate our limitations became our greatest gifts. We had no money. We had only 12 days. So we knew we only had one or two takes and only one or two setups maybe. So for the most part, we decided to just go with one setup and Robert's theory behind it or his, his, his vision Um, was that each frame was going to live like a photograph and we were going to live within that frame. So as an actor, that's like doing theater. You just walk on stage with a, with an idea and a complete understanding of the scene and you're blocking and so forth. But you get to just then just let, you know, take your hands off the wheel and just see what happens because you know, it lives in that one take and what, even if somebody trips, if somebody drops something, you get to play that moment instead of somebody freaking out. And we have to reset it because it's not going to match this shot. And you lose these beautiful organic moments that may elevate the scene or send it in a trajectory that you never expected. So given that you only had 12 days to shoot, does that mean you and Robert got together beforehand and, 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 and prepared the crap out of out of the film? Or did you was there a level of spontaneity, which you just referred to as well? Um, it was both. It was both. Robert and Oscar, our DP, you know, who worked with us on Integrity, um, they worked together a lot. And, and Oscar had, because, I mean, you got to think, Jordana, this is, our crew was Robert's students from BYU, you know, seven students that our focus puller had never pulled focus. Our sound guy had then, never done. I mean, why, does it, why does it look better than most films, though? I don't understand. I, I just, can you please tell me what the magic pill was that this film had? Because... I think it's Robert. I think, I mean, I think Robert is a photography professor, right? So for him, composition and lighting, all of it's so, so he's a little bit of a wizard when it comes to making it look beautiful. Um, And again, he wrote this script that just put us in these great situations and then allowed us all to be free and organic. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, I forget what the first question was, but yeah, no crew. And again, these kids, oh, Oscar and the vision. So yeah, we, Oscar had been Robert's student um, and was learning and wanting to be a DP. And Robert was kind of wanting to get away from shooting because Robert had had a partner that I had met. When, when I met Robert, they were, he was partnered with another guy, Rodrigo, and they were making all their films together. And what I learned on Joseph Chambers, because Rodrigo decided to take a break and he didn't want to work on this project with Robert. So it was Robert's first time directing alone. What I realized was that Robert was essentially the DP and he set up all the shots and he took care of everything technical with the film. And Rodrigo would kind of work with the actors. Um, So when we got to set, Robert just visually had a full layout and he had worked, he had storyboarded every single frame um, and he had worked extensively with Oscar and gone to the location so that Oscar had an understanding of what he was going to need lighting wise. But when I say that, I mean, it was Robert and Oscar setting the lights. We didn't have grips or electric, you know, and we only had two lights. um, So we had to, you know, kind of 
use them. And yet it looks so stunning. I mean, I recently did um, ADR for the film, which hopefully we'll, we won't use any of. Because you and I, you and I always prefer like the, the. It's like whatever whatever magic we captured the day of. It's like please don't like let's not add any any. Don't mess it up. Don't mess, don't it, mess up. it up. Yeah. So I didn't. Robert and I didn't get time to prepare. I mean, this was quite quick, Jordan. We shot. He wrote. We had a, a short film in August called The Drift um, that was about, it was essentially when David goes to pick up the kids and the boyfriend comes outside. So it was like a five minute short, 10 minute short. And then Robert, I, I, I suggested that we have a feat, we create a feature. So he went and wrote for like two months and came back with um, The Killing of Two Lovers. And we were on set the day after Thanksgiving. So there was no prep. We just kind of had to hit the ground running. And we actually spent two days reshooting stuff because we were unhappy because we just hit it so fast. And we're like, we have to go reshoot this piece and this piece. Um, but no, no prep. But again, you know, that's, I think money and time, and not always because time and prep is really crucial, but sometimes I think when you have too much of everything, it gets in the way and we lose whatever that little thing is inside of us that, you know, that instinct, that creative instinct that I think gets squashed in the process of, the repetitiveness of it or the amount of time and, and, and energy and all the crew and the money and the hoopla, you know, just sitting in the space and me wearing the clothes every day and thinking about David 24 seven for 12 solid days. I think that's what makes great performances. That's what makes great films. Um, and I'm hoping that a little film like this can help us get back to that 70s style of filmmaking where we're just telling great stories. Mm -hmm. And also where you're not, you're not stuck in in, in polarity, right? Because because one of the other things that struck me as I rewatched it, and I'd I'd love to pick your brain about. Um, I guess you'd you'd call it. It's it sounds it's going to sound weird, but like your version of of masculinity, right? Because the film begins and you want to shoot someone for betraying you ostensibly, but then when she's when you see them outside their house this couple and they're separating and it's complicated. And you, you rarely see that mostly in film with divorce and separation. It's mainly, I hate you, get the fuck out of my house. We're gonna argue over child support mm -hmm. and that's that. But when she's like, you gotta give me some space. Like we're, we're, we're dealing with this right now. We're gonna see how it plays out. I'm butchering the dialogue, of course, but you've never really seen that level of subtlety on film and, and, and what, what struck me the most was the contrast between you wanting to kill someone at the very beginning to then you being able to accept that from her, knowing that she's with another dude. Like how, like, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's very unusual. But don't you, I mean, you just went through this, right? And isn't it amazing when you love someone or you have had loved someone or you've had this extensive time and then it starts to break down. It is the peaks and valleys and, and, and don't you, I mean, aren't there times where you feel like you're completely just outside of yourself? I, I, yes. To me, that's yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's what we wanted to capture. We wanted to try to find that moment that we've all felt where we are completely irrational. And then 10 minutes later, if we're with our, we're meeting a friend for lunch, it's amazing how we can flip it. And I, I just, to me, that style of storytelling, or at least character development, that we don't all wear the black hat or wear the white hat at all times. Mm -hmm. I think we're constantly changing it in and out, depending on who we're dealing with. And that type of storytelling really, or if, if, again, those types of characters. Mm -hmm. It's so and, true. I feel like we need a little more of that. I agree with you. There's not, we don't see these types of, it, it's, also, you don't see this type of subtlety, I, I feel, but what you really don't see is I don't feel like the middle of this country is represented necessarily in these types of situations. We've seen divorce on film, but I find it's in, the, it's in larger cities where there's more resources. You know, one of the stories Robert and I were telling that the reason why or one of the influences for this film was this couple that he knew in Nebraska that went through the process to get a divorce hired a mediator, filed the proper, proper paperwork, and then realized that financially they couldn't afford a divorce and had to make it work. And they're still married today. And I was like, holy shit. Like how, you know, we don't see that. And, and, you know, like my grandma, my grandpa were married for 72 years, 73 years. My granddad's like, it wasn't always rainbows and roses, man. Like it was, 
us trying to survive and back in the 1940s in Alabama, it was easier to survive with another human being there to help you. Wow. Right? Yeah. Interesting, you know, and I think that's why it's so hard for us nowadays to stay committed. It's why divorces, we're all getting divorces, that it's, you see it on, you see it all the time is because, I mean, these little devices in our pockets, we can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Food shows up to the house. Um, we, we no longer need anyone else. So mm -hmm. to choose someone, that's a process. And I think it's something that we're learning. It's a, it's a different, it's a, it's a different mindset as it relates to love. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, to get back to how ADD we all are, I think it makes it all the more flattering and, um, and hats off to you and Robert, because the fact that this movie is so arresting and has captured so much attention, I think is so much of our attention is um is is a testament to you guys hmm. um how much tonally do you think it's going to have the same how much better are you going to retain an integrity of joseph chambers i think robert what i learned watching and i i he, he i met robert in 2009 he made a film called jack and the rabbit and it's following his little boy um eli when he was like four on a bicycle with a BB gun strapped to his back and he's going on. He's and I remember feeling this just sense of anxiety watching this little child on this open road and then going into the woods. And I'm like, where, you know, and the whole time you're on the edge of your seat and it's just this little boy going to hunt a rabbit. And I realized that early on that Robert's skill set was creating tension when most filmmakers and those types of stories are unable to achieve. And when I watched and I felt when we were making uh, Killing Two Lovers, it was going to be a little art piece. I felt like it was going to be a beautiful, slow burn film. I did not anticipate holding my breath. I did not anticipate at moments sitting on the edge of my seat. So I watched that first cut. And I mean, with no sound in black and white, the first cut that he sent. And I knew we had to make something that was more traditional thriller. I felt that his he was going to thrive like in that Hitchcock type world, um, which is why the integrity of Joseph Chambers, you know, we had been sitting on that film since 2012, wanting to make that thing. And I felt, man, I could see the trailer after watching the killing of two lovers. I was like, this thing is going to move and people are going to be on the edge of their seats. And I can only imagine how you guys are going to use sound because it was, it was used in such an innovative way. And killing of two lovers, but given that for a lot of integrity of Joseph Chambers, you're not to give too much away, but you're in, you're alone, you're in the woods, like mm -hmm. you're talk about a mind fuck, like you're you're going through a lot. So I can only imagine how sound will be used. Yeah, and we're working with the same team. Um, Robert and I actually leave Monday to go to we're going to Copenhagen, which is where Peter Albrechtson, our sound designer, lives. Um Thanks to the U.S. Embassy uh, denying their work visas, uh, which I'm excited to go to Denmark, so it'll be exciting. But um, yeah, you're right. I think we have less dialogue and in the integrity of Joseph, Joseph Chambers than we do Killing Two Lovers, which is exciting because it leaves a lot of room for Peter to build out the film. And I mean, he the people he's he's brought in, I mean, we've got Oscar-winning Foley teams and those guys just, they approach sound as another character. And that, for Robert and I, I, I feel like, I, and I feel like it's crucial to Robert's storytelling as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I cannot wait to see it. Yeah, I think it's going to play really well. The the rough that we just sent to Venice, so exciting. Um, they're playing with some really cool things. He found a guy that has been recording sounds of nature for twenty years all over the world. Just you know these things that he thinks about to bring in. You know there was moments in, for instance, in the Killing of Two Lovers outside of you know he came to us initially and said hey i don't know if you guys realize this but the door opens and shuts on david's truck 76 times he's like maybe that's part of the sound design like that's all he hears is that and he's playing with this gun wanting to blow his own brains out wanting to go kill his wife wanting to kill like this weapon and and it was so interesting but then he would do things like the truck, for instance, so that it didn't become boring. The sound of the truck, he mixed like the roar of a bear and a lion with like a stop hot it. Water. I'm dead serious. And he would be mixing these things and we're hearing a lion roar. And I'm like, 
what the fuck are you doing? Peter is like, well, just give me a minute. It'll be okay. Hold on one second. Just let me play with this here. Hold on. Now listen. And it's like, I'm like, oh, fuck. That is. So for him just to think outside the box, you don't get that in the U.S. I, I haven't found it anyway. I feel like with sound designers, Robert and I working with these guys, you spend all of your time just trying to get them to where you want it to be. And then there's mm-hmm. no time left to experiment. And with Peter, he comes in here. So we're able to just, yeah, sky's the limit. It's exciting. I mean, given how collaborative this process has been and given that you've, so so not, so in this you're wearing sort of writer, producer. I mean, you're, you're, you've, you, you have your hands in a lot of different pots in this. How are you ever going to go back to just, and I would find it very difficult to go back on a production and just be like, okay, please show me my mark. Mm. Right? That would, I mean, because, because I feel like you have so much um, creative energy. It has to, and it's, and now we see what the, um, what the result of that is. Like, I mean, look, Jordan, obviously it would be a dream to, for people just to, uh, you know, support us financially so that we can kind of tell our stories. But, you know, the reality is I have, you know, a family and so forth and you have to work and, and do your thing. But um, I don't know. I mean, look, you worked, <laughs> you worked with me. You know how my energy is on set. I just want it to be great so bad. If I'm, if I'm away from my family and friends and my farm and all the things that I love to be at work, which I love working so much, but only if we're all there to make it great, you know? And I, I don't know. My, uh, my wife asked me the same question. She's like, are you going to just be able to show up and have somebody tell you to go stand over there and say this and do that? And I was like, I'm going to have to at some point, I'm guessing. I don't know. We'll see. Well, or or not. I feel like also the business is changing so much and there's so many different ways of, of um, showcasing stories. And so so maybe not. We'll see. Hey, look, I agree with you. I, I, we're, it's exciting. Nonetheless, you know, I'm excited. We've got the new film, which you're amazing in. Um, and if we're if we're getting close, I wanted to ask you a question. How is this the Fast 9 coming out, which is just like taking the world by storm and hopefully getting us all back into theaters, um, which is where I love, you know, watching stories. You were pretty young when this, how old were you when the, you did the first one? I was, a, uh, I was like I was 19, 19 or 20. The baby. How, I mean, how has this, I mean, how has it changed your life? And I know it's, that's probably a mouthful, the, um, the amount of films and, and span of, of years, but how much, how has that changed your life? It's, you know, what's funny to me is um, I hadn't seen the first one for so long and I was always sort of poo-pooing my experience on it and going, wow, I, I just, I've rewatched the first one recently and I was like, God, I, damn it, I was good in though. I was really good in the first one. And yet, um, uh, anyway, I just wanted to give my, my former self credit for, for that, um, for back in the day, but it changed my life in that it gave me I feel like to have a franchise that carries you through the age of 20 to now I'm 41 Mm. and takes you around the world and gives you this, this sort of built in audience is such a blessing. It is so awesome. And I, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's given me the ability to play in other areas that I want to play in, which is, which is really really wonderful so yeah it's funny i'd forgotten how young you were but of course you know we shot uh our stuff in integrity of joseph chambers in my father-in-law's house so about a week before uh we started shooting i walked into the house and fast and the furious was on tv and i go um what are you what are you doing dex he's like oh, i'm watching my girlfriend on uh, tv before she comes here and uh, shoots her movie you know so <laughs> i got to see <laughs> i i forgot just how young and i was i sat there watching it with him and it just yeah that's 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 amazing i, I can imagine the platform kind of do other projects and other things if you wanted to yeah it's really cool and it's, it's also it's also really cool that it's coming out on the 20th anniversary and 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 as you said hopefully it um gets everyone's butts back in theaters because I feel like we all read it, need it right about now. Agreed. Yes. Well, Clay, thank you so much. This was very informative, 
super fun. Hopefully we get to do it again for integrity of, of Joseph Chambers. I feel like that would be a lot of fun. Well, let's hope it doesn't suck and we definitely get to do that. And um, it's not going to suck. It, <laughs> hopefully it's from, all from, in person and we can be in the festivals and in person and do Q and A's, all the fun stuff, you know, the, those are the rewards for making these cool films. Isn't it? Totally. Um, the reward was also seeing that trailer, which was so good. I was so oh, excited by it. I'm so happy you like it. You're great in the film. So I'm excited for people to see it. Thank you. As am I, as am I, you make me look really good, Mr. Crawford. Gotta oh, say it. Jordana. You're a good Jordana. scene partner, buddy. Well, I agree. You are as well. And, um, Thank you for doing this today. Thank you. It was fun.